and he was playing worship. But he kept starting the song and then stopping. And went, oh no, that's not it. Uh, but that's not right. He did it like four times. So my, I was with a friend of mine who's super shy. Super shy. And um, she goes, excuse me. She tells the whole group. They all look at him. She goes, my friend leads worship. Could she just do it? You don't ever do that to a musician. Like you never like give, give that person your instrument and they're gonna play better than you. You know what I'm saying? I died a thousand deaths. But you know, I, what was I gonna do? And then I thought, well, Jesus needs to be worshipped, so they all may hate me, but I'm just gonna take the guitar and lead worship. So I took it and I led worship. Well, it was that that my husband was watching me lead worship, and because um, he was there. And he opened his eyes and he said, who is this girl? And he said, I had oomph. That's what he said. That's what attracted him to oomph. Because he goes, he met a lot of nice Christian girls. They're nice, they go to church, but they weren't, they didn't have oomph. And so um, I found out later that Bible study only happened once. And the reason why, because the fellow who was putting it on, he was dating a Mormon and he wanted her saved. So he had a Bible study and taught so she could hear the call. <laughs> but he's all like, you know, like he's a young guy trying to manipulate situations and all that. And it, that's why it was weird. It was weird. It was weird. That's how we ended up meeting, and then the story goes on and on after that. But it, it was neat because he, he ended up later, he, they broke up, him and the girl. But she later got saved, and they ended up being married and serving the Lord together. So, hey, weird things. Right? Some of you with your kids that are following the Lord, you're like, what are they doing? God has them and he'll use their weirdness. Especially when their heart is their heart is pure. You know, and maybe they got methodology all off. God thinks it's so cute. You know, it's like it's like Mother's Day breakfast, right? When kids are four and they want to make you breakfast. Oh it's the worst, isn't it? And you have to eat it and you know, Kool-Aid just poured over you know, lucky charms, and and then they put marshmallows and cherries in it, and then, look, mom, you know, and you're like, thank you, and they're gagging, but you receive it, because their little heart's on. Now, they need to mature. If they were 18 and did that, so then you'd be like, you know, I'm like, bacon and eggs and all that. So there's been maturing, but we can be patient with people who serve lucky charms with Kool-Aid on them. So let's go ahead and pray for this morning's study. Lord, we thank you that we have been allowed to gather in your name this morning to enjoy you and to enjoy each other. We thank you, Lord, for all the pain and the problems that many of us are in. We thank you that we're here. We got here. We got the money, the time, the health, transportation, the desire to come. Um, you just, we think we make so many of these decisions. But truly, God, you're the one who makes a way in the wilderness. You're leading us more than any of us perceive. And you are, um, your hand upon us is much more, uh, is what is to be credited or more of what's happening in our lives than we, we perceive. So um, out of great respect and awe for you and our little minute understanding, we do want to say thank you for being so kind to us and faithful to us and not giving up on us. And Lord, you, you, you understand what we've been through. You know the things that maybe have weakened our um, ability to process things. Or we're wounded and we're just, man, we got like PTSD and, on everything. And, and you're just so kind with us. You're patient, you're kind. You believe all things, hope all things, endure all things for us. We don't have anybody in our lives that loves us the way you love us. I've never known a love like yours in any human relationship. And Lord, for the girl here that's just like, I don't feel loved. Lord, help her to know that her feelings do not determine truth. The Lord, you do love her enough to shed every last drop of blood for every sin she has and ever will commit to guarantee that she can be white as snow. And when she takes her last breath, she can enter into the joy of the Lord. <clears throat> Father, bless your word this morning. Send it into our lives. Let it run swiftly. 
And we thank you, Lord. Help us have humility of mind this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. What time do I have till? Don't say forever because that's not good for me. <laughs> I'll go forever, so. Oh, lunch is at noon. Lunch is at noon. I don't know how I'm going to tell what time it is. Let me see. It's 10.50. Oh, here I got it on my little Kindle there. Oh, it's actually 7.17 p.m. on mine. <laughs> Is there a clock around here? I don't know. I'll give you my watch. So did you lend, could you lend me that? Oh, yeah. oh, just to keep me on track, because it's not good to tell me however long. I can see it. It's beautiful. So I actually have until, well, let's see, so we're at 10 20. So I, maybe I can go until like 11, oh, I think 45 minutes. It's okay? Okay. Okay, now if we could all read together our verse, I want us to read it out loud together. Um, Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Sometimes we do a little too much talking up front. <coughs> Y'all need to be the people who talk too. Plus, I love to hear all these women speak the word of God. It's all about me. <laughs> I can just hear them. So if we get together and if you just read, just stay seated and read Jeremiah 17, 5 through um, 8, right? Yeah. Okay. That's just a lot in three verses, huh? Five, six, seven, eight, four verses. Okay. Okay, so I'm reading out of the New King James. If you have a different version, just read it anyway. It doesn't matter. Okay? I mean, really. Chinese might be a little hard. To Any other version, even Spanish, still flow. Okay. Ready? Begin. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert, and shall not see when good comes but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in the salt land which is not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out the roots by the river, and will not fear when he comes. But its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Thank you. So we learned last night about the time and season that this prophecy was given. And all of us can be a lot like the kingdom of Judah, where we've become complacent. Even if you're not going through that season now, you might go through that season a year from now. And God is equipping you to know what to do when and if those seasons hit you. You also might be hearing this today for someone else. Someone's going to come to you, and you're going to have something to give them because um, you've been equipped through the teaching of the scriptures. Um, I think sometimes we're narcissistic when it comes to Bible studies. You know, like, this doesn't apply to me. You know, or somebody starts talking about marriage and you're single. Or somebody starts talking about single and you're married. But, you know, we have a lot of people in our lives on completely different roads. And I don't know about you, but I sure like to be able to give somebody something that they can use, you know. And so we should never come in to a Bible study saying, Lord, um, this is all about me. Sometimes we look at the scriptures almost like, People look at astrological forecasts. We want to know about our lives and my life and God's will for me. Now, God does want us to know that. But it's, um, it's kind of sad. I remember one time there was a gal who came into my uh, office. We were meeting for discipleship. And, and she just said, you know, Maureen, I really want to know God. Like, I want to know him. I really want to understand the way he thinks. Can you recommend a book that would help me know that? And I was like... <laughs> so I picked up my Bible, and, and then she goes, well, I know, but I go, can I look at your journal that you have when you meet with the Lord? Would you mind letting me see your personal time with the Lord? And I looked, and I said, I told her, I said, you know, everything in here is about you. I told her, I'm seeing the problem. I said, I said, everything is about God's will for your life, and what you're going to do today, and revealing your past and what's wrong with you, and how you're going to change. And God loves to work on those things with us. But I go, there's nothing in there where you're finding out and discovering God, and how he thinks, and what he values, and what he says is worthless, and what he says is valuable. And it's interesting, because in the scriptures, it talks about if we get to know him, or if we gaze into his glory, we become like him. So sometimes the transformation we're looking for is not learning about ourselves through scriptures, but learning about God. And then we start to become like him, and we didn't even know. 
And that's why I wrote, and this is not like by the book, I wrote a book called Knowing God's Scriptures to train us a little bit. Because one time I told her, I sent her home, I said, come back in a week, I want nothing about yourself in your journal. I only want things about God that you get from the scriptures. And we kind of worked on training. And instead of reading something like, um, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and then writing, God, you're going to show me the way. Um, you're going to show me truth about myself. Instead, she had to write, like, wow, you are life. You, are, you bring life when there's death in things. Like, wow, you're the way, you're the road. Like, you're actually a path for, for everyone's life. You, you have us going in movement. You're a God who wants us to have destination. Like she started to be able to pull back from her little life and go high into the heavenly places and learn about the God who created her. You do not have to buy the book. But what I'm saying is in your own, I, one of the reasons why I wrote the devotional, I told her, I said, you do know you inspired an entire book because you, you were like so narcissistic. You helped me, you helped me um, write it. But what it was is, to train people that you don't need that book. But you could do this yourself, where you sit there and say, I'm not gonna write anything. I'm not gonna look for a command to obey. See, we've all been gone through those devotional exercises. Write down a command to obey, uh, something that you know, we have this little thing, love it, it's really helpful, you can do it. But sometimes, take a, take a fast from self, and just write down things, what do I learn about the Lord through this story, about the way he thinks, about who he is, about um, his priorities. It's really, um, doesn't come easily, because we're really self-consumed, especially in America. We're trained to be that way. So you have to stop and just, even if you read a story about Jesus walking on the water to the ship, you know, asking Peter to come out. We're all into Peter and us, and you know, take me where my feet would never wander. It's all about us, but we sit there, wait a minute, what about him? What, about, what do I learn about God from this? story and it'll be a little stretching because we don't do it very easily but I encourage you to try to do that with the scriptures so we learned about the prophecy last night and the time that it was given and we learned that we could all be going through these things but we also learned about the Lord that he really wants us to be people who flourish that it's his heart to see fruit in our lives that he doesn't want us to be shrubs in parched lands he, we are his vineyard. We are his garden. And he delights in walking through the garden and enjoying the green leaves and the fruit that comes from our lives. He delights in that. It's always good if, you have a, if you're a gardener and you walk out there and you just look at everything and, oh, it's so beautiful. And the flowers, like spring is coming and all these really neat things happen. I know we actually kind of have seasons in California. A little bit, but we do have our own, I can see them. And in my house, I have a lot, of, we live in the hills, and right at spring, all these different flowers, uh, we rent, and so the lady who owned our home, she planted such beautiful flowers that just come out at that time. And sometimes I just walk through and I just go, man, these colors, and it's so beautiful. And when God's walking in your life, and he's walking through my life, it pleases him to see these things. He wants us blessed, and he wants us to produce fruit. I want us to remember, too, that prophecy is, um, is still for today, even though it was for them. And it is there to trim and to make the garden of the Lord all that he wants it to be. There's a whole other study. I always use it to you guys. And in Isaiah, I have never done this so much, and it's for you guys. Um, in Isaiah, where the Lord says, you know, I planted this vineyard, I put everything there so it would be really great, and it didn't it produce sour grapes. I love that phrase, you know, because sometimes when you're at to it, it's like sour grapes, huh? And you're like, oh, I'm producing sour grapes. And the Lord said, but I gave you everything I could give you to make your life fruitful. Isn't that encouraging to know? We think we lack, but when the Lord is our shepherd, we shall lack nothing to produce the fruit he asks us to produce. Not the fruit that somebody else is producing, but in our own lives, the fruit he wants. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful. It's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training us in righteousness. Why? 
Well, so that the man of God, so that you and I would be thoroughly equipped, not just equipped, but thoroughly equipped, and I love this, for every good work. Being a mama of a baby, being a student, being a daughter, being a wife, doing certain things, taking care of your elderly parents. Scripture equips us for every good work. I'm kind of, you know, just talking to the choir here because most people who pay money to go on a retreat, they know that. They're like, I need more. I need to be equipped. I don't want to miss out on something God has set apart to put into my arsenal and into my kitchen, into my pantry, so I can do what I need to do. I love kitchen appliances. Only if you use them, though. I don't like the ones that you buy because everybody buys the Instapot and you just all say, I have one, and you never use it. I like them when you use them. I love the fact that, you know, I got an immersion blender, a handheld immersion blender. I'm crazy with that thing, you know? I'm going, mm, mm, mm. I'm making salsa, mm, I'm making pea soup. Mm, you know, I'm even when I'm making my pinto beans, I liquefy them. Mm. Well, I love when there's a piece of equipment that makes my life so much easier. I have a, a, one of those like slap choppers. I don't like the take out, plug in, put it in, it's just too much. But I can slap it. And it's, stop, 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 stop. Sometimes my kids are like, what's going on? I'm chopping onions. I'm chopping onions. <laughs> but they're all uniform. You know, I do a little exercise. And it, it's easy to clean. Yeah, I don't cry because the onions are hidden under there. You know, it's all, all everything's like nice. When I can make soup, my carrots and celery and onion are all the same size. They cook, you know, perfectly at the same time. I love that little thing. You know, they break pretty easily. Maybe I'm too old. <laughs> but I love when I have equipment to do what I need to do. It makes life so much easier. And the Bible says that scripture, including this prophecy we're looking at, is intended to equip us for, for every good work. And you know, there's works we get, they're very good in the eyes of God, but we feel very inadequate or not trained, correct? There's some people who just fly through things and you're like, ugh. You know, or something comes into your life and you're like, you want to send it back. I know when I got cancer, I wanted to say, um, you know, like you're at a restaurant, I didn't order this. You know, I'm cancer intolerant. Can I just take it back? You know, I didn't want it, I didn't order this. But, you know, things come into our lives we didn't order, but they, they still come into our lives. And the good news, even as we study this text, is God's equipping us through this text. We're gonna leave here equipped for every good work because of the scripture that we're studying. And that's so encouraging, isn't it? As we look at this text, God tells us it's going to be useful. That first of all, we're going to be taught. We're going to be taught. We're going to be instructed. That means we're, there's things we don't know. Just to let you know, there's things we don't know. And now you have to go into a Bible study knowing that. Even if you're a Bible teacher, if you memorize Genesis to Revelation, you are going to be taught and you don't know everything. I remember one time I was counseling this couple, which I don't generally counsel couples. My husband and I were supposed to counsel the couple. And then my husband got called out for some emergency. And he goes, go ahead. I go, I don't want to counsel a couple. He goes, well, I'm sorry, they're here. They need counseling, and I have to be over here, so you're going to do it. And I said, great. So then I'm sitting there going, you know, you were on the boast of my weakness. I could do all things in Christ that I do me. You know, you're like going, if I just, I'm going, if I just pray for them, I'm sure that's better than nothing. Yeah. So, you know, I'm sitting there going, ah. So, you know, this couple comes in. And the, the man and the woman are dealing with some things. And then I told the man, you know, I really think you should read through Nehemiah. Because it sounds to me like the walls are, are really destroyed. Kind of around your marriage and around your life. And like kind of learn what it takes to rebuild things that have been slowly decaying. Because those walls have immediately been knocked down but over the years. You know, erosion and weather. It, it took a long time to rebuild those walls. And so I say, I think you should just go through with Nehemiah and see what God speaks to you. And he goes, I've already read Nehemiah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's why they're here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can kind of tell of the problem. So <laughs> don't do that. 
Don't say I've already heard it. Don't, you know, like, I, this is a girlfriend of mine recently. She's so precious. And she said that she's been approaching her devotions. And she bows her head and says, Lord, I pray that I read this text as if I've never read it before. Yeah. And um, she said things are just dancing off of the page into her heart and her life. And I said, she was really, she said, I go in there and act like I don't know the next word. That's what they say to change versions sometimes. You know, if you're used to New King James, switch over to something else. That also, it's an interesting thing to do, is to read a chapter in reverse. Read chapter, I mean, verse 10, then 9, then 8, then 7. Because you'll see things reading backwards. It's hard to follow flow. But you'll it, read it through and then read it backwards. And you'll see things you never saw. Or read chapters backwards. You'll go in Ephesians and read chapter 6, then chapter 5, then chapter 4, then chapter 3. It's a way to kind of look at the word with a fresh take um, so that we, we don't predict it. Because sometimes in our mind we, we already know what the next word is. And we're arrogant without even meaning to be. We're just, we're just getting a little numb. We get ear fatigue. You know, I'm, I made a CD and I've done some different CDs. And sometimes you're in the recording studio and you have to shut it down because everybody gets ear fatigue. Everything starts sounding the same because you've just heard the song too many times. And you have to leave and say, well, come back tomorrow because our ears have just gotten too used to the song. We're not hearing what we need to hear. So uh, it is important to have that fresh attitude at the scriptures and realize we will be taught. We'll be rebuked. It says the scriptures are for rebuking. And rebuking means really confronting us on things that need change. That, um, you know, I, 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 the rebuke is always in love, you guys. The Lord isn't there just to go, oh, you idiot. You know, he's, he's not that kind of a father. You know, he, he just challenges us because if we're doing something wrong, it's going to lead us away from all the good things God has for us. And so he's going to sometimes scream if we're going down a river and he knows there's a waterfall at the end of it. He has every right. I want him to scream and yell. You know, get out, you jump ship. You know, I, I tell him, yell at me. If I'm not picking up on something, please yell at me. It's also the scripture is given for correction. And we know that correction is saying, look, you need to get, this is what was wrong. Correction is, this is what is right. It's, this is what you're doing wrong, now this is the right way to do it. I'm so glad he does that. I think scriptures are a lot like an orthodontist. You know, he doesn't just show you how ugly your teeth are without intending to straighten them out yeah. to make them right. So every time we're convicted by the Holy Spirit, you know God has a plan to then do something wonderful, new, and straightening in our lives. Embrace rebuke, embrace correction, and be so happy somebody loves you enough to take you to what your full potential is and not leave you stuck or getting worse and worse in the patterns and behaviors that we've inherited or we've learned or we just do innately because we're sinners. All of that, and training too, all of that's intended to thoroughly equip us for every good work. I think it's a joy that we get to get away here and know that God is equipping us through Jeremiah 17. He doesn't want us to lack in anything. And as we heed his instruction, his rebuke, his correction, his training, we will be thoroughly equipped. The scriptures will show us things we've never known, show us how to look at and handle things in ways we don't innately do. I remember when I was first saved and I was reading the Bible, I was like, what? You know, like, I don't do that. You know, that's probably why my life's all messed up, you know, like, or I read it and go, no way. I mean, I like talk out loud and just read the Bible. What? Like, who can do that? You're like, it was such a high standard, but it was beautiful. I knew it was the right thing, but I'm going, man, you're going to take me there? Me? I'm a, such an idiot. I can't believe that you really are going to take me there. Like, I remember so many years after being saved, I was at work one time, and somebody was telling a dirty joke or something, and they said, oh, don't say that in the morning. You know, she can't handle that, you know. She's so pure. And I'm like, oh, they think I'm pure. I was like, oh, happy. Like, oh, me, I know who I was. Like, wow, they, they're, they, like, I've changed. I'm becoming holy as he is holy. And, you know, it's so exciting to know that we, he changes us like that. The scriptures really do tell us what's wrong and confront us. 
And I'm so glad that he's sending his word this weekend in here. I want to remind you too, it trains us. And training often involves hearing the same thing again and again. Don't ever grow weary of hearing the same thing again and again. Um, it's very easy to forget things we've heard over and over. Or we didn't use that truth for a really long time. And it's good, it's ingrained, because it pops up when we need it. So let's look at this first part of the prophecy for God's people and for us in Jeremiah 17, 5. Now we're starting with the cursed. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. Cursed is the man whose heart departs from the Lord. Verse 6 in Jeremiah 17. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert. He will not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in the salt land which is not inhabited. So first and foremost, it says, cursed is the man who trusts in man. If we are people who put our trust in man, the Bible says that we are cursed. And that curse means not blessed. It means a frustrated life. It means you're going against everything the Holy Spirit wants you to do and to experience. You know, if you fight against God, he's going to win. <laughs> and you're going to waste a lot of energy. You know, it's always better to say, you know, Lord, I, I, I don't think I can do this. I don't know how to do this, but I will do this. There's a great power in the word will. If you look through the book of Psalms, it's a lot of will. I will lift my eyes to the heavens. I will, um, uh, I will serve you because I love you. It's an act of, of yielding your will, not going along with your feelings and your desires. Usually will, when you choose something, the feelings will, will follow the, the will. And, and I'm glad God gives us will that I have a choice to make in every situation. I may not be able to choose what comes into my life, but I can definitely choose how I respond to it. And that's very empowering when you know God will show you, this is the way, walk in it. This is what you need to do. I know, ladies, that things come into our lives where we feel frozen and stuck and unable to choose. We almost feel like the situation is forcing us to make choices we don't want to make. Ladies, it's not. It's a lie. The enemy is a liar and the father of it. And one of the grand things he does is try to intimidate us and say we have to do something when we don't. You're allowed to wait on the Lord and be of good courage until he strengthens your heart. I was talking to Tracy about that the other day. It's very rare that you have to make a decision at the moment. It, it does happen, but it's rare. But there's a lot of moments that make you think you do. You can walk away. I can't tell you how many times I've sat in front of a doctor and they said, well, you, know, you need to you know, pick this out and what are you going to do? And I go, I'm going to go home and pray about it. I don't want to make that decision right now. You're freaking me out. <laughs> Ugh, I mean, this is too medical here. You know, all these like alcohol and swabs and fluorescent lights. And I want to go home to where the flowers are. And I want to pray and I want to find out what I'm supposed to do. I can wait on that. So many times they've given me like medicine. And, well, if you don't take this medicine, and then I go, well, I'm not sure I'm supposed to take that medicine. So I, I'm gonna wait on that choice. I'll call you back, I'll email you, I'll, something like that, because sometimes we get bullied into making decisions by, the, by everybody else's expectations. Your family members, your friends. You, you should respect it and say, do I, if somebody says, no, you have to decide now. You can ask them, do, do I? You know, maybe you do. Maybe there's something you don't know that, yes, it expires at midnight tonight, you know, so we lose the inheritance. Well, you know, make the decision. But if they say, well, no, actually, you don't have to. They say, well, can you give me a time limit? By what day do you need my response? And walk away and come under the control of the Holy Spirit and trust in the Lord and not in man and man's timing. You know, even some of you at school, well, I have to register because, you know, I'll miss the semester. And then I'll, I remember I talked to some of my poor thing. She goes, but if I don't go to school now, 
um, I'll graduate later than all my friends. And I said, and? I said, well, and? Why, why, why do you care? Like, really? Like, this is what's important? You're going to make a decision so that you're on the same pace as your friends? Because you have, they, you know, they love you, but they're not that into you. You know, you can make your own decisions for your life. You can graduate later. You can take a semester off and go to Europe. If Jesus tells you to. You know, just remember you're much freer, and I'm much freer than we deem ourselves to be. We end up being enslaved and, and controlled by just ridiculous things because we place our trust in man when they say things have to be done. And usually they don't have to be done when people say they have to be done. Sometimes there is. If someone's on the operating table and they rush out and, you know, don't wait. <laughs> you have to make a decision. person's in the operating room. You have to make a decision. But be sensitive to spirits. You know, is that just someone else's expectation on your life? You know, or is it really need to be made right now? We don't want to work against what's good in life. Cursed is a man who places his trust in man. Trust in man doesn't mean that God doesn't use people. Um, he'll use people as the answers to prayer. He'll use people as the means to meet our need. Um, he'll use people who have skills, property, um, to, to, to help us. And, and we see the answer to our prayer through people often, don't we? Um, I think that's a real fun thing to pray in the morning. Lord, I pray I would be the answer to people's prayers today. You know, sometimes when we're moved to do something, we're, it's a prayer they prayed, and God wants to do it through us. And, you know, when that happens to us, somebody does say, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you just did that. And I, I just prayed about that this morning. And it's so neat. Everybody's all flowing in the flow of the Spirit. You know, it's not curse, it's blessed. And it says, curses man who trusts in man. See, God made people to often help people. Um, we have doctors, mechanics, nurses, teachers, parents, pastors, bankers, husbands, accountants, consultants. We have a lot of people that we use to help our lives flow the way they're supposed to flow. <clears throat> God uses people in our lives, and certainly we can look to them. And certainly we can trust what they say. And we can see how they might play out in a time of need. But God's not talking about just the simple trust enough to hire someone. Or, yeah, I'll have you be my doctor or do this surgery or anything like that. He's talking about um, not the trust to, enough to recommend them to someone. This trust is a word that means total confidence. I mean, just absolute abandonment to this person's place in my life. They are absolutely responsible for the things that they're doing, and I'm putting my whole life into their hands and trusting them completely. If we look to people this way, God warns us, we will not be experiencing a blessed life. We will have a cursed life. We must guard our hearts when we're looking to people in times of need or trouble. I know that, um, you know, I need a lot of help. I, I'm I've been through a lot, times that I'm more vulnerable than other times, sicker, other times I need help doing a lot of things, and um, I need people to help me. But I remember I asked the Lord so many times that I wouldn't look to the people of my church or my husband or anybody and expect them to perfectly meet my needs, because I will have a cursed life. I'll be angry at people. I'll, why don't they know what they're doing? You know, like, why don't they read my mind? Or um, it, I'll push away the very help I need because I'm putting my whole trust in people. If you put your confidence in people, we push people away and we lose the relationships that we need that God wants to use to support us. We put too much on them. Have you ever had somebody do this to you? It is suffocating. And it's like you, you run the other way. Because you know that they have you like too high on a pedestal or too short of a leash in your life. And you're like, don't do that to me. I tell people, don't put me on a pedestal. I'll get knocked off and it hurts. And it's your fault. <laughs> you know, don't, don't do that. You know, like don't, don't, even when somebody's consistent or faithful or we thank them for how much they help us, our confidence is not put in those people. People can become idols in our lives. 
And what we, I mean, I've thought about it. I looked at my husband and I told him, I said, now don't be like dying of a heart attack because I need you. Yeah. So don't be doing that. So <laughs> just, I need you because I have cancer. So just don't even think about getting sick or in a car accident. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> but in the back of my mind, he could have a heart attack and he could die. And, I'm, and I remember I said, well, Lord, if that happens, just like you provided my husband, you'll provide somebody else if I need people help. Because I'm looking to the Lord to provide. I'm just looking to the people as he provides them. And he knows, you guys also, you think you know who is supposed to be the person that God uses, and oftentimes it's someone you would have never picked. And it's more suitable for that season of your life and, and, the, and, and what you really need from the person. I'm a little bit of, um, I like to be alone, a little bit of a hermit. And um, I like to be alone, and sometimes, I get a little overwhelmed with like, I love people and I grow from people, but sometimes there's like so much going on, I'm like, whoa, there's like so much going on. And so sometimes people want to come over and I'm like, no, I just want to be alone with my dog. But I, I like to ask Jesus what he wants me to do because I became a Christian, which means I'm following Jesus and not my personality. So when somebody wants to come over, and I'm like, oh, no, 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 come over. I like to stop and go, Jesus, is this person supposed to come over? And then if he says, I sense yes, then I think tell the person to come over. And they're like, oh my, oh, I don't want anybody to come over right now. And then they come over and they're like the perfect person for the moment. They say, they say the right prayer. They make me laugh. They, I enjoy them. Oh, I'm so glad that that person came. I'm so glad I didn't go by my own feelings. I'm so glad I have Jesus to tell me what I need and what I don't need. And you end up bonding and making a friend with someone you would have never made friends with. And you're so, so thankful that Jesus is deciding who comes in and who comes out. See, some of us are arrogant. We think we really know what we need. We don't. Our shepherd knows what we need. And we have to humble ourselves in the morning and say, Lord, you know what I need today. You know if I need to be around people. You need to know if I need to be alone. You know which people should be around me. I, I, I surrender that need to control the, my life and the way it goes and believe that you have my best interest in mind. Um, people really can be idols in our lives. And we can usually detect when people have become idols or too much in our eyes are. We put our trust in man. One thing is if we panic, if they have to leave our lives, they move or they die, how dare they? I know that's true. Like, it's one of those things like people can die and it's not their fault. And I mean, I, I cried to my husband and my kids and told them about this cancer. I said, I'm sorry. I would never leave you guys. I would never just leave and go to heaven and leave you guys alone. Like, I would never choose to leave you. But you know, if, if me leaving doesn't just grieve someone, but actually shakes them to the core of where they can't find their faith at all in God, I am too important to them. And, and, and if somebody moves to another state, have they done that? You're like, what? Or your manager, they do a reorg, and you're under someone else? I remember there was a doctor I had, and he was so good. And I came in, and he said, they're transferring me down to San Diego. And I, I panicked. I went, what? Uh, uh, you know, no, you can't leave. And the Lord said, you put too much confidence in the doctor. Look at the way you're reacting. Look at, you can see the symptom that you put too much confidence. It's like, you know, like taking your temperature. I said, oh yeah, I kind of have. He goes, you have to trust me that that was the doctor for that season. And if I'm moving him, it means you need a different doctor for the next season of your care. I'm moving people around in your life because I love you and I know who you need and who you don't need in your life. Also, if something somebody does or says something that doesn't work out and you're really mad at them in a really horrible way, that means you put too much trust in them. Well, you can't forgive them. I'm sorry, do you have some water? Just a little sip would be awesome. That's okay, don't be sorry. I'm not even slightly offended. And just, uh, I have to, I have to do this. Um, I should have brought, I need to just bring one up here. Um, if you are unduly you don't, you lack mercy for someone when they get something wrong, you put too much confidence 
in them. It doesn't mean you can't be disappointed or say, why did you do it wrong? But if it's like, you know, rage, thank you so much, you might have put too much confidence in that person. Thank you. <clears throat> also, if um, they suggest something and it, doesn't, and it doesn't work out the way that we want it to work out, we, we, we put too much confidence in them. This can happen. We can put our trust in man without even realizing that we've done it. That's why in Jeremiah, it's written to God's people, not unbelievers. It's written to believers that put their trust in man. I know sometimes people like leave churches because they, the they saw the pastor you know, on the road driving. <laughs> and he's driving nuts. And they're like, that's a pastor. He shouldn't be driving like that. I'm leaving this church. But you know, he's just a guy. And he's just driving nuts. And he's wrong. And he should you know, drive the speed limit. But it doesn't mean like that makes him like not a reputable teacher of the word or a godly man, you know, he's just a guy. You know, it's like, give them a break. Um, when we recognize we slip from simple trust to placing our confidence in people, the first thing we need to do is confess it before the Lord. And say, I, I'm doing this, I've done it, I'm wrong, I see it. Your scripture just corrected me, rebuked me, and showed me. And confess, the word confess means to agree with. Uh, it comes from fess, which means to speak, and C-O-N means with, so you speak with, you agree with. That's why the Bible says confess with your mouth. A protest is to speak out loud. Confess means to agree with. So you're agreeing with God. You're saying, okay, I see it. I've, I've been really hard on my husband. I feel like I just expected him to be perfect. Or I, my friend, my best friend, they didn't you know, meet my needs. Or the waitress didn't serve me when I thought they said it, you know, just arrogant, just more too confident in people. And uh, apologize to the person. If, if you put too much pressure on them, and they've seen it. Say, so, you know, I'm really sorry. I've, I've put too much expectancy on you. And the Bible says that our expectation comes from the Lord. And say, I, I do trust you. And you're a great friend, and you're being used by God greatly in my life. But I think I've been leaning on you too much and getting frustrated, and that isn't your fault, that's mine. I've been, I've been putting my trust in you, instead of just trusting you as a friend, as much as you can, being led by the Holy Spirit. Please forgive me, and um, let me know, if, I, if you feel that pressure from me, let me know, and I, I'll, I'll try to redirect that. Um, and then redirect that confidence to the Lord. Say, my, you know, lift your eyes to heaven. Psalm 118, verse seven, says, the Lord is for me among those who help me. Do you love that verse? Like when people help me, that shows me the Lord is for me. So when there's people helping us, the Lord is for me. Psalm 118, verse 7. He's among those who help me. So the Lord is doing that with people. That's why we don't put our confidence in man. It says, therefore I shall see my desire on those who hate me. Verse 8 of Psalm 118 says, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. The Lord is for us among those who help us. I love that. He sets up connections. He has people move in your neighborhood. He has someone join your church. Someone gets hired at your job. Some person's in your class at school. And he sets these things up. And you're just amazed that he does that. And he not only does that for you, but he's moving you to be around people, to meet their needs as well. God uses people, but we must never trust in them, only in the Lord. It says in Jeremiah 17, 5, it says not only curses a man who trusts in man, but makes flesh his strength. This means we lean completely on that which is temporary. Like we actually just start building on temporary things. The flesh represents that which goes back to the earth. It's, it's here now, our bodies are here now, but all of this is gonna decay and go into the earth. I remember we were shopping for caskets for my mom or whatever, and we're walking through and my brother leans over and goes, that one has a 30 year warranty. That one has like a 25, why? How would you know whether it passed the warranty? I go, I don't know, that is weird. She's like, is there a warranty on the casket? And we're just like, like, we all go back to dust, you know, either way. 
And so we have to remember that all that's of the flesh is, is very, very temporary. Um, man is here today and gone tomorrow. Remedies that work today might not work tomorrow. You know, fleshly things, sometimes God uses something, but he does it the next time. You know, I mean, I remember going through all kinds of trial drugs and different things, and, you know, I just can't put my trust in any of those things, you know, because, you know, one day they can work and another day they can't. Or you have some weird side effect, and you're like, ugh, I never want to see that again. And laws and advocates, they change, don't they? You're protected by a law in the land, and it gets overturned next year, and that law will not protect you. So we can't even put our confidence in laws. Um, they can change in a moment. Anything from the flesh of the world is temporary. So even though God might use it temporarily, we're, we're cursed if we put our total confidence in those things. Um, Psalm 33:16 says, "No king." Psalm 33:16. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. Even if he has a multitude of an army, that's not what saves him. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. Verse 17 of Psalm 33. A horse is a vain hope, an empty hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. God's people had to know that their king, their army, and their horses were not going to save them. And especially in this situation, because God was not going to let them win. He was going to have them be taken captive. He was going to let them lose, lose from a worldly perspective, but he was just guiding his people to a place where they come back to their first love. Sometimes we have to lose things to find things. We have to have great losses to realize they really weren't all that we thought they should be, to find the things that we would have never looked at if we still had those things in our lives. I mean, how many of a, of a single girl holds on to a relationship when God's like, let it go. I have somebody better for you. And on their wedding day, they bow their knee and say, thank you for taking him out of my life. You know, just, you know, that old story where a, 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 a dog's got that bone, you can't get it away, right? But if you bring them a steak on the bone, they let go of the bone, but now they got the meat and the bone. And that's what God says, drop the bone, I'm giving you the steak. You know, just drop it. I have something more for that meat on the bone for you. God was their strength, and he is ours. We can prepare our horse but, and have people on our side, but our confidence has to be in the Lord. We still go to the doctor, we take our medication, we carefully manage our money, and you know, we do things with wisdom, because by wisdom a house is built. You know, by instruction it's filled with precious and, and precious and something substance. It's, it's, it, we do our part, but our confidence isn't in our obedience either. Our confidence is in the Lord, because we don't see how it's gonna play out. And I don't think we'd do very well if we knew how. I, it's hard for the moment. I can't, I'm mean, just thinking about the future is like way too much for me. Like well, this afternoon's too much for me. You know, just right now we're here in a room, we're enjoying the word. It's nice, isn't it? So let's, let's enjoy it and be where we are. And he's our confidence. Proverbs 21, 31 says the horse is prepared for the day of battle. But deliverance is of the Lord. We do our part. We prepare for an interview. We go to school. We do everything we're supposed to do. But we don't put our confidence in those things. We do our part, but we do, we'll be cursed. We have to lift our eyes and know that deliverance is from the Lord. Verse 5 of Jeremiah 17 continues and said, Whose heart departs from the Lord. And it's a heart issue that happens. We often slowly wander. We know that, that line in that song, you know, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. That's a, such a sweet line. We're in a place of humility, not always going, you know, I'm committed, and I'm, you know, I mean, remember Peter, I'll die with you in less than 24 hours. You know, I'm going to die. You know, <laughs> I, you know, it's just lay low on the boasting and 
be a little more on the boast in your weakness. I'm capable of falling. I could commit adultery on my husband. I could fall away from the Lord. I could become an addict. We could do anything because we have the sinful nature that has all kinds of wonderful, horrible things in it. And so we have to be humble in the morning. You know, it makes us merciful to people too, you guys. If you guys are always cutting everybody off, you, know, you just, you know, oh, how could they do that? You know, you got some heart. Your heart is departing from the Lord. Your heart is puffed up and taking confidence in itself. Where is our trust and affection? All of us can lose that first love relationship with Christ. We, and you know, sometimes we stop praying about everything. We'll take it from here, Lord. You know, in Philippians 4, 6, it tells us to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Everything. Where's the keys in the morning? And you're yelling. Where are the keys? I got my keys. I know I put them out. You're a shrub. <laughs> Everybody's running from you. But what if you said, Lord, where are my keys? Lord, help me find my keys. And add with thanksgiving. Or thank you that my eyes see I'm not blind. And I can look for them. Like add the giving of thanks and pray. And suddenly you're not shrubbing out. You're not pokey. You know, those tumbleweeds are pokey. You're going to poke everybody if you don't pray about everything. It's the little things that make you and I hard to get along with. It's usually not the big ones. The big ones, we turn on the, ooh, I'm dependent on God. It's the little things that make our kids run, our husbands stay late at work. You know, it's those things. So we have to not have our prayers become stale or predictable and not lose our dependency on the Lord. He said, I'm the true vine. You guys are branches. You, know, you don't have your own identity apart from me. You can't receive nourishment apart from me. You can't be stable and not be kicked up unless you're connected to the vine that has the roots itself is in Jesus Christ. I think one of my favorite ways to start the day is coming before the Lord and I say that. I go, here's your branch. Apart from you, can't do it. I just position myself as absolutely dependent from cooking breakfast to um, you know, knowing how to answer the phone politely. I don't know how to do anything. So just, you know, I'm here. Branch, you're the mind. Right now I position myself completely drawing from who you are that you would flow within me. It says that if we, our affections and confidences get misplaced, we're cursed. We're not blessed. It says in verse 6 that we're going to be like that shrub in the desert. And we won't even see when good comes. We're going to inhabit parched places in the wilderness. That means nobody is there. It says in a salt land, it's not inhabited. Nobody wants to be around you. You don't want to be around you. I've been there. You all been there? Like, I don't like me. You know, and you can't get away from you because you're in you. You know, it's like, ah! You know, it's like, you understand why people don't want to be around you, what the way that you're doing it. You don't want to be a shrub in the desert by being someone who has your confidence in the arm of flesh, people, the way you think things should happen. Ladies, I love the fact that we're women and we're planners. If we weren't planners, there wouldn't be clean underwear, fresh milk, right? Eggs, paper towels, right? There'd be like, what, baloney? Like, I don't know what would happen, but it would be terrible in the world if we weren't here. But there's a fine line of being a woman who plans well and keeps things in order versus controlling and expecting things to go because you're such a great planner. You know, that's arrogant. Confess it as sin and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I've gone beyond taking care of my family and I am a militant, you know, person that if things don't go the way that they should have gone because I did everything I was supposed to do, take it down a notch. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and say, I have gone too far. I'm sorry. That's my propensity. Just admit he loves you. He's not mad at you because you're like that. He's, remember, he's trying to correct us, right? Because he doesn't want us to be a shrub in an inhabitable place where everybody's running from us. He doesn't want us to, to be people who don't see when good comes because we're so focused on the way things should have gone. We miss 
the redirect that God has for that day, that holiday. How many people have ruined the Thanksgiving or Christmas because things didn't go the way you went. you knew they were going to go, and you missed it. It was supposed to be, uh, you know, the turkey was supposed to burn. It was supposed to be gross. So you sat around and had some quesadillas and just like, <laughs> as, you know, as low, not a lot of dishes. And it was just going to be the most memorable Thanksgiving you had. It was a redirect. You did what you were supposed to do. It, it just, you know, whatever happened, happened. And you just laugh at it. Don't, don't be so hard on your sides. Do your best. Praise his bless. He'll take care of the rest. Remember that whole thing? It's just, you know, do your best. Praise. You guys know that song? It's a real old song from um, Keith Green. But uh, that brittle, that shrub, is also, it's not rooted. You know, shrubs are not rooted. They're tumbleweeds. And when the wind blows, it just goes in the direction of the environment. And when we're trusting a man, we're affected by our environment, and we let it take us in directions we aren't supposed to be in. Definitely no fruit. Definitely not grain. Brittle, easily broken. Um, and it says we won't see when good comes. When we're so fixed on, no, he was supposed to do this, and this was supposed to work out this way. We totally have our eyes. We're trusting in everybody other than the Lord. Our eyes are on the wrong things. Our focus is in the wrong place. And we don't even recognize when the answer to prayers come because they weren't the way we thought they should have happened. And we miss it. Bummer. We become so sure we know who, how, and when God will do something, you know. We have it all figured out that we, when we trust other people that we miss the answers to our prayers sometimes. And that's very sad because God does things in such unique ways that we'll miss it if we have it all figured out. Psalm 62, 5 says, My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He's my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. That was in Psalm 62. At all times. I love when we're singing that song about um, hiding. You know, I'm going to hide and it's going to be my strength. And we think coming out boldly is strength. And it's actually saying hiding. I, go, I, I was back there, I went, oh, I can hide. Like, how do you do that? that? That makes me strong, you're just kind of hiding. You know, there's a verse that says, I will um, make you my refuge, and it says, until these calamities have come to pass. I love that verse. Like, you're kind of hiding in the cave, and the storm is going on outside, and you're just going to stay in there until it calms down. I said, Lord, I can do that. I can hide in you until these calamities pass. That's, thank you, Lord. That's my strength. I, I can do that. But if it's strength, like go out there and I don't know if I could do that one. But I know I can hide. Hiding is pretty easy. <laughs> so I'll do that. It says in verse 6 of Jeremiah 17 that we'll end up inhabiting the parched places in the wilderness in the salt land which is not inhabited. Very dry. Not among the living. God's people ended up doing it. They, they went to Egypt for help. Can you imagine that very country that enslaved them so many years ago? You know, they go right back to it. Some of you go right back to credit, charging things, back to something that enslaved you. Go ahead and take a few Percocet to make it through the day because you're overwhelmed. You end up addicted again. Just I'm just going to have one sip of, you know, a margarita, and you know you have an addiction problem, and you're back into slavery. You're back into this. I know it's just, just this one time. No, no. Don't do that the one time. So if it enslaved you before, most likely it will enslave you again. They were to surrender and allow Babylon to come in. They looked at false prophets to tell them what they wanted to hear, and they were not able to recognize the voice of the Lord because they didn't want the voice of the Lord. They didn't see good when it came. May we be warned that misplaced trust will result in barrenness, dryness, loneliness, and partiedness, and we'll be like a shrub, and we'll be in an uninhabited place, and we'll be brittle and moved by everything that blows into our lives if we put our trust in man or in the flesh. Lord, we need this help because um, it happens very easily in our lives, and I'm glad you're teaching us about this because we need to be humble enough to say, I can do that, or I have been doing that, or I'm, I, I, I want to be... I want to recognize that when that happens. 
And Lord, let our hearts not depart from you. And may we be women, Lord, who understand the importance of placing our trust in you. It's not a passive trust. It's a placing of our trust. It's lifting our eyes to the Lord from whence comes our help. It's really saying, even telling ourselves, trust in the Lord. It, it, it's commanding our soul. It's commanding the place of, of dependency to transfer to you. Lord, expose in our lives if we put too much trust in any person, relationship, or institution, and help us to redirect that. Because we don't want to be shrubs, Lord. We don't want to be brittle. We don't want to poke other people. We don't want to live in an uninhabitable place. And so thank you so much for this teaching. It's very helpful. Thank you for putting it in the book of Jeremiah for us. In Jesus' name, amen.